questions. Question oral, the honourable member for Regina Capel. Eight years of liberal waste and corruption have driven inflation to record highs, and nowhere is this more obvious than in housing costs. In fact, after eight years of liberal deficits driving up inflation, the average renter now pays over $2,000 a month in rent. Now, to a wealthy Prime Minister who brags about his vast family fortune, that might not seem like a lot of money. Maybe that's why he signed off on a $7,000 a night hotel stay in London last fall. Why did the Prime Minister think it was okay to bill taxpayers for a single night's hotel bill what the average renter pays in three full months? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Mr. Speaker, uh, Canadians have the right to ask themselves why is it that every time uh, real supports for renters comes to the floor of this House that the Conservatives vote against it? They voted against the Canada Housing Benefit that is delivering and investing an average of $2,500 to vulnerable renters across the country. They not only voted against the $500 one-time one -time, top up to the Canada Housing Benefit, they pro played procedural games in this chamber to prevent real help to Canadian renters. The Honourable Member for Regina Capel. Mr. Speaker, this scandal stings taxpayers so much because it comes at a time when housing costs are taking more and more out of Canadian paychecks. After eight years of Liberal deficits, interest rates have risen, meaning homeowners have to pay more to the bank in interest payments just to stay in their own home. In fact, after eight years of this Liberal government, the average monthly mortgage cost has more than doubled, and the average 600000 mortgage sees interest costs go from $12,000 a year to over over $30,000 a year. So again, does the minister think it was a good idea for the prime minister to bill taxpayers for one night's hotel stay what homeowners pay in two full months on their mortgage? Yeah. The honourable minister. Speaker, does the honourable member think it was smart to vote against real help for home buyers? The first time home buyer incentive, $40,000 tax-free savings account for first-time home buyers, doubling the, the first-time home buyer tax credit, introducing a once-in-a-lifetime rent-to-own program, $200 million, supports for first-time home buyers in terms of increasing supply, banning uh, foreign foreigners from owning Canadian residential real estate. Does the honourable member really think those supports for Canadian home buyers were, were smart to vote against? Thank you. Honourable Member for Regina Capel. It's always smart to vote against inflationary deficits that drive up the cost of living. Yeah. You know, the Liberals have learned the wrong lesson from this hotel bill scandal. You'd think that after billing taxpayers $6,000 a night for a single room, the lesson learned would be book a cheaper room next time. Instead, the lesson these Liberals have learned is cover it up better. Emails between the PM staff revealed government officials scheming to cover up the scandal. One even suggested bearing these costs in next year's public accounts. And the word finally came down from the minister herself to simply stop answering questions altogether. All this at a time when Canadians are paying more just to stay in their own home. Why is treating taxpayers' money with respect? Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last fall, Canadians mourned the death of a monarch of 70 years. And we had a delegation led by our Governor General and our Prime Minister that was appropriate and was important for Canadians. It was absolutely essential that we attend that. And while this side of the House is focusing on us, we're focusing on them. We're focusing on their cost of living. We're focusing on their cost of housing. We're focused on their cost of childcare. And we will continue to be focusing on the Canadians while they focus on us. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Lizzie Chemin, Levy. So we see that they think it's normal to spend $6,000 for a night at a hotel. After eight years of this government, Canadians are hurting financially. Inflation is rampant, and today we're debating a motion that calls on the government to rein in its spending, stop the waste, and eliminate the taxes and deficits that gave way to the current cost of living crisis. Will this government finally do the right thing and introduce the fiscal and budgetary measures that are necessary to get the country out of this disastrous inflationary crisis, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister for Sport. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives talk about overspending and waste. What is this really about? Our spending seeks to help families who really need help. Our programs are targeted and adapted to help those who really need it the most in our society. For example, 
our $500 top-up to the Canada Housing Benefit, that aims to help people who need it. We are making housing affordable for families. We are helping those who need help the most. The Conservatives should stop voting against all the measures that we are implementing to help Canadians, and maybe they should propose some solutions. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Les Etchemins et Lévis. Well, one solution to help would be to not spend $6,000 for a hotel room. Mr. Speaker, food banks, after eight years of this government, are experiencing a record number of visits, 1.5 million visits in one month. A family of four will have to pay $1,065 more for food this year than they did last year. One in five mothers is skipping meals in Canada. Mr. Speaker, this mess bears the signature of this incompetent government whose mistakes and failures continue to pile up. When will they finally show some compassion and clean up their mess, fix the situation? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to remind my colleague that when this party took office in 2015, one in eight Canadians was living under the poverty line. Since we took office, we have lifted 2.7 million Canadians above the poverty line. So the Conservatives say that we should stop spending and stop helping Canadians. What they're really saying is that we should send those 2.7 million back under the poverty line. It's unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, there has not been agreement on health care, because for there to be an agreement, people would have to agree. The Prime Minister's offer to his counterparts is being imposed on them. The Prime Minister capitalized on the fact that Quebec and the provinces are stressed to the limit by the health crisis caused by federal underfunding that he is personally responsible for. Provinces are so strapped up against the wall that they have to accept the unacceptable. The Prime Minister could have fixed his chronic underfunding of health care, but instead he settled for buying a bit of peace, and on the cheap at that. Why didn't he choose to actually help provide care to those who need it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my colleague for his question and for his interest in this very important matter. We are very happy about the announce ma announcement made today by the Council of the Federation. We thank the members of the Council of the Federation for their significant and important work. Since the Prime Minister called for a meeting with the provincial counterparts a week ago, we have met with all provincial uh, counterparts. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, Quebec and the provinces have been calling on the federal government to pay its fair share, 35 per cent. But the Prime Minister's offer brings up the federal contribution from 22 per cent to a measly 24 per cent. But let's not forget that when the government took office, the federal government was paying for 24 per cent. So this new agreement, all it does is fix the government's own mess. We want 35 per cent. We need 35 per cent. The Prime Minister's going from 22, 24 per cent, 22, 24. Nothing changes, meanwhile. And does he realize that in the meantime, our health care systems are crashing and burning? The Honourable... Heritage Minister. Mr. Speaker, I wonder where my colleague was this morning when the newspapers had headlines saying agreement, federal provincial health care agreements. This is hailed as a positive agreement which will help the health care. It will help us get more frontline medical personnel. We will be able to invest in the men and women who make a difference every day in our health care system. We will be able to invest in health care. We will be able to ensure the survival and the thriving of our system. It's not just an agreement. It's a good one, Mr. Speaker. Statistics Canada reports that nearly half of Canadians, 44 percent, are reporting they're struggling with paying their rent and groceries. On top of that, Canadians pay some of the highest cell phone and internet fees in the world. The Rogers Shaw merger will only make things worse. Canadians who are already struggling will have to pay even more for their cell phone and internet fees. Now, the government has a choice today. Will they stand up for families and say no to this merger, or will they put billions of dollars in the pockets of billionaires? Which is it? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, it's very simple. We stand on the side of Canadians, Mr. Speaker. That's why yesterday my Honourable colleague would have said we issued a directive to the CRDC to lower 
lower prices for Canadians, to bring more competition in the sector. And Mr. Speaker, the members knows well, I've said all the time, what matters for me is to bring down prices, to bring competition. And the best way we have done that in this country is to have a fourth national player. We will always act in the best interest of consumers in Canada. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. So if I just heard the Minister correctly, Mr. Speaker, does that mean he will oppose the merger today? <laughs> We know that the Rogers-Shaw merger is going to mean higher bills, higher bills for cellular. We already pay some of the highest bills of any country in the world. This merger will make things worse. It will make bills more expensive. So the minister has a choice today. Here's the choice. Will he block this merger and defend people or not? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for his important question. Now, my colleague knows that Canadians who are tuning into question period today have seen that yesterday we issued a directive to the CRTC. The directive asks them to take action to reduce bills in Canada and to increase competition. I've said this many times in many, on, in many places, Mr. Speaker. Our goal is to get bills down to increase competition. And the best way to do this in Canada that we've found is to have a fourth major player. Canadians should know that we are always here to defend Canadian consumers. After eight years of the Liberal Prime Minister's incompetence, home heating has become a luxury. He said he couldn't find a business case to provide the world with clean Canadian energy and cancel pipelines, making the cost of home heating double in this country. Yet he found a business case to shovel billions of dollars towards Liberal crony insiders, giving them cushy contracts. And now Canadians are having to turn down the heat and wear blankets right before he triple, triple, triples his failed carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister come up with a real climate change plan and stop with the virtue signaling so Canadians can keep the heat on and take the tax off. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remind my honourable colleague that the politics we're putting in place will help Canadians reduce their dependencies on expensive fossil fuels and replace them with Canadian generated clean electricity reducing their energy bill Mr. Speaker which is why we have worked to help Canadians in Atlantic Canada and across the country reduce their home heating bill Mr. Speaker thank you very much well, member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. The problem with that plan is that it's not an environmental plan. I looked for it. I couldn't find it. Can anyone else find it? No. Mr. Uh, Speaker, did you okay. find it? It's not under here. <laughs> what I did find was a tax plan. A tax plan that made gas, groceries, and home heating more expensive. A tax plan that hasn't helped them meet a single emission reductions target, and they've made emissions go up. When will they stop with their fake virtue signaling? Cancel the failed carbon tax so Canadians can keep the heat on. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is somewhat rich coming from the opposition that flip-flops on carbon pricing faster than I can flip my pancakes in the morning, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> One minute they're in favor of carbon pricing, the, the next minute they're not. The minute after that they are for Thanks carbon pricing. Me. Last election, these Thanks members of opposition me. campaigned on carbon pricing, Mr. Speaker, and now they're saying they don't. I, I'm just I'm going to have to pause for a second. I'm having a hard time hearing the answer up here because of the heckling going back and forth. And I know everybody wants to hear the response just like they want to hear the question. The Honourable Minister, you have uh, 15 seconds left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, the Conservative Party of Canada, with their reckless policies, flip-flop faster than I can, on carbon pricing, faster than I can flip my pancakes in the morning, Mr. Speaker. They're, it's impossible to know what their position is at any given minute because they change their position so often. Thank you. Well, member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal Prime Minister, Canadians are facing a generational cost of living crisis. According to the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, Canadians are now facing the biggest financial challenges of their lives. And yet, these Liberals continue to double down on increasing carbon tax, which will occur again on April 1st. Conservatives will keep the heat on and take the tax off. Will the Prime Minister show some compassion and scrap the carbon tax? The Honourable 
Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important in this House that we actually are not misleading Canadians. As the, uh, as the official opposition knows, eight, eight out of ten Canadian families... The Honourable Minister, from the top, please. The, the opposition knows full well, even though they actually don't say it publicly, that 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back than they pay in the price on pollution. Certainly affordability is a critical issue, but so is climate change. And I would say it, it is enormously rich for a party that cannot even acknowledge the reality of climate change to be asking about the government's climate plan. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals do not have an environmental plan. They have a tax plan. And and, you know, they are starting to sound like a broken record of broken promises and failed policies. The reality is that 38 per cent of Canadians are near broke. Now, this is according to the federal government's own researchers. Just this morning, I met with some students from Burnaby's Simon Fraser Student Society who told me that students are missing meals because they can't afford to eat. So will the Prime Minister take responsibility for students who can't even afford to feed themselves, or will the Conservatives have to fix what he broke? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Certainly affordability issues are critically important for all Canadians. I think everybody in this House can agree on that. Certainly this government is taking steps to address affordability concerns across the board. But one of those, to be honest, Mr. Speaker, is a price on pollution where 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back. It is an important policy to reduce emissions and fight climate change, but do so in a manner that promotes affordability. My goodness, it is time, it is far past time that the official opposition actually acknowledge the reality of climate change change and put forward a plan that Canadians can look at. Yes. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that after eight years of this Prime Minister, one in four Canadians cannot afford a $500 unexpected expense. Nearly half of Canadians are concerned about affording their rent and their mortgage payments, which have doubled under this Prime Minister. And too many Canadians are concerned about heating their homes because it has got, become so expensive under this Prime Minister. And now, on top of that, the Liberals are going to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax. Will they help Canadians out by keeping the heat on and take the tax off? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, the hypocrisy of the other side is astounding. We're talking about affordability, about helping Canadians to make ends meet, and the other side voted against a $500 top-up on housing. They voted against dental supports for 500,000 kids. They voted against rental supports. Mr. Speaker, they voted against supporting Canadians at a time when they needed it the most. They have no plan. We do. We will keep supporting Canadians. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, what we voted against is putting more fuel on the fire. You can't spend your way out of, uh, out of inflation. Mr. Yeah, Speaker, yeah. the fact is that their carbon tax plan it is a failed plan that has not met any target that they have set. Even the Bank of Canada Governor has admitted that the carbon tax is contributing to inflation, and the Parliamentary Budget Officer says that households will pay more in carbon tax than they will get back in, in rebates. So will they help Canadians out by keeping the heat on and take the tax off. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fort McMurray forest fires cost Canadians almost $6 billion. Alberta floodings in 2013, almost $4 billion. Ice storm in Quebec, $3 billion. Atmospheric rivers in British Columbia, $8 billion. That is only a few of the examples, Mr. Speaker, of the increasing cost to Canadians of climate change. And what's the answer of this reckless opposition party? Make pollution free again. That's unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we will support Canadians and we will fight climate change. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker. I'd like to talk to you about the notwithstanding clause, which is the only little scrap of autonomy that is guaranteed to Quebec and the provinces by the Constitution. That was the compromise that Trudeau Sr. came up with in order to get the provinces to accept their Constitution, which, by the way, Quebec never signed. 
The clause represents the right to make different societal choices without having them overruled by judges or by the federal government. Yesterday, the son of Pierre Trudeau, the Liberals and the NDP voted against this right. Why is the smallest bit of autonomy for Quebec and the provinces too much for the Liberals and the NDP? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, our government has always been clear about our concerns regarding preventative, preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects our rights and freedoms. It was also created to protect the rights of minorities everywhere in Canada. Preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause does away with the important dialogue between the courts and this House. That is why we are against preemptive use. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Well, they should go and read their constitution, reread it or read it for the first time. Because nowhere does it say who should have the first word or the last word. In fact, Section 33 gives precedence to Parliament, not to the courts. It's therefore exclusively the choice of Quebec and the provinces. It's written in black and white. It's very clear. But that's what the Liberals and the NDP take issue with. The notwithstanding clause clearly and unequivocally guarantees the governments other than the federal government can make decisions without asking Ottawa's permission. Is that what they take issue with, not having the final say? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I remember the debates we had at the time of the Canadian Constitution. The notwithstanding clause is always there as a last resort. Mr. Speaker, legislating to repeal rights in Canada is a very serious matter, which means that the notwithstanding clause in Canada should be used as a last resort. It's important that the legislative and the judiciary can have dialogue. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The notwithstanding clause has been used mostly in Quebec. It's been used to defend our national language and our distinct values. It is no coincidence, Mr. Speaker, that the Liberals and the NDP are fighting the clause today. They want to challenge Bill 96, which protects French in Quebec. They want to challenge Bill 21, which protects secularism in our state. They also want to prevent Quebec from introducing any other law that they might not agree with. Their problem at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, is that Quebec is different, and the notwithstanding clause allows Quebec to express its difference. Is that not what they really take issue with, the Liberals, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. I'll tell you what the Bloc Québécois problem is, Mr. Speaker. They had a whole opposition day all to themselves. They could have chosen any topic. They could have talked about how to help seniors, the environment poverty, how to help people. And you know what they chose, Mr. Speaker? They chose to talk about the Constitution for the whole day. Talking about the Constitution doesn't put food on any Canadian tables. It doesn't help any Canadian families. How totally out of touch with reality does one have to be to choose that as a topic? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadian businesses are beginning to sound the alarms. Now take Gio, who owns a small coffee shop in Edmonton. He has to bring his beans up from South America, but, he ha but due to rising costs of fuel, transportation and utilities, he's had to hike his prices 25%. Now it's policies like the Liberals' carbon tax that continue to drive up these costs. Now Conservatives will keep the heat on and take the tax off, so when will this Prime Minister get out of the way so Conservatives can fix what he broke. The Honourable Minister. Well, I can tell this Honourable Member what this side of the House does for small businesses. We stand by them every single... We stand with... Minister, please, from the top. I'll tell 
my honourable member, what this side of the House does for small businesses. We have their back every single time. During the pandemic, it was about keeping their employees on payroll. It was giving them a loan so that they can get through every single day. Now, it's about helping them get new customers by going through e-commerce. It's about helping those businesses get access to new markets all around the world. And I might say that those businesses are doing terrific. They're doing terrific because they are increasing their businesses and creating great jobs for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Right the Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Really, Mr. Speaker? That minister wants to tell us about small businesses? I think it's the Ethics Commission that just told us all what they do with small businesses. <laughs> now that more than half of Canadians are spending over $200 a month or more to heat their homes. Now just ask Linda, she's a family of four and she's choosing to skip meals than to heat her home. Now Conservatives will keep the heat on and take the tax off, so when will this Prime Minister get out of the way so Conservatives can fix what he broke? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. I thank my honourable member, colleague from Edmonton, and wonder why he voted against taxes for small business when he had the opportunity to support them. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I can tell you, I can tell you, just in the jobs report for January, 150,000 new jobs created, 121,000 full times. I don't know where he is, Mr. Speaker, but in Edmonton, things are going well. We're supporting Canadians. That's our job. Excellent. The honourable member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, British Columbians are really struggling. Liberal policies have pushed home rent and fuel prices through the roof. We pay the highest prices in North America. It's projected to hit $2.65 a litre this summer. Liberal solution, let's double down, no, triple down on the carbon tax. That'll force them to not to drive to work or take their kids to soccer. Will the Prime Minister take responsibility for making life more expensive? Will he keep the heat on and takes the tax off? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would remind my honourable colleague that 8 out of 10 Canadian families actually get more money back than they pay on the price on pollution. But I would also remind my honourable... Okay. okay, I think things are getting a little bit out of hand. I'm just going to ask everyone to take a deep breath and when someone's speaking, not say anything other than the person who's entitled to speak. The honourable minister from the top, Thank please. You. But I would all also remind my honourable colleague who comes from the same province that I do that it was in 2008 that the British Columbia government put in place the first price on pollution in North America, showing enormous leadership in the fight against climate change. But if he has a problem with the price on pollution in British Columbia, he might want to raise that with the Premier. Well, member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Yes, Mr. Speaker, this minister should know that British Columbians receive zero back in tax rebates from the federal government. After eight years of this prime Minister, everything is more difficult. In Surrey, a thousand Indo-Canadian owner-operators met to protest that the Liberal government and the Port Authority don't care about their livelihoods. They're, they're being forced to unnecessarily buy new trucks. They're also struggling to pay for increased fuel prices, including the carbon tax that is tripling. Will this Prime Minister take responsibility for his actions and admit he doesn't care for hard-working Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's interesting that the Honourable Member points out that British Columbians do not get a refund, as every Canadian who lives under the federal system does. Eight out of ten Canadians get more money, money back under the federal system. If he has a problem with how that, that process is implemented, and I believe the Honourable Member used to be a member of the political party that brought the price on pollution in, he should raise it with the Premier. selling preferential access to surgery for those with money to pay for it. They are exploiting a loophole in the Canada Health Act that is costing Canadians up to $28,000 
per procedure. Even former Liberal Health Minister Jane Philpott says this contravenes the principles of Medicare. New Democrats believe Canadians should have access to care based on need, not wealth. Why are Liberals letting for-profit clinics prey on the desperation of patients and allowing two-tier access to care in yeah. Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the question from my colleague and for his collaboration on the Health Committee. We believe on this side of the House that all you should need in order to get health care is your health card, not your credit card, and we'll always stand up for Canada's universal uh, public health care. Canadians are proud of our system, which has always been based on need, not their ability to pay. Our discussions with the Premiers included the importance of upholding the Canada Health Act, which means making sure that services are based on need and not a person's ability to pay, and will always protect Canada's equitable access to universal health care and services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Quilquitlam. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals said they would defend public health care, and now they're not. Another example of Liberals putting the interest of corporate profits over people is the flailing Canada Infrastructure Bank. This bank has failed to deliver the climate resilient infrastructure needed by communities and Liberals don't want people to know this. Mm -hmm. This government is keeping that information secret and out of the hands of Canadians. Why are the Liberals protecting a bank that isn't delivering for Canadians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The, Canadian, the Canada Infrastructure Bank is an innovative way to deal with infrastructure gaps that our country faces. Would the member opposite like to tell the, uh, in, for example, the Manitoba Fibre Project that has over 400 jobs created, 49,000 households will be connected to broadband. Would the member opposite like to tell those residents, those people who are employed, that the Infrastructure Bank is doing nothing for them? Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to invest in good infrastructure right. right across this country. Yeah, that's right. The Honourable Member for King's Hence. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia's wine, grape and fruit growing sector is facing an uncertain future. On the weekend of February 3rd and 4th, a polar vortex event hit Nova Scotia with sustained temperatures of minus 25 and a wind chill record of minus 43. This coupled with the fact that we had one of the mildest uh, winters on record in Nova Scotia has resulted in significant damage. Early estimates suggest that we will completely lose the vinifera crop and up to 50% of hybrids and the fruit industry is concerned about peaches, cherries and stone fruit. Can the Minister of Agriculture provide some guidance to producers in my riding and across the province about what programs they should take and whether or not she's received any application from the Government of Nova Scotia for an agri-recovery framework. Thank you. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I would like to thank my colleague from King's Hand for his continuous dedication for agriculture. We recognize that the recent weather events impacted the grape growers of Nova Scotia and caused them significant stress. And I want to assure them that we stand ready to assess the disaster as soon as the province may submit a request for agri-recovery. And until then, I invent I invite them to make sure or to uh, check their eligibility for the programs Agri-Insurance, Agri-Invest and Agri-Stability. Thank Bravo. you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg au Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, what news this morning? The Quebec government is urging the Liberal government to include a mechanism for mandatory consultation with Quebec in Bill C-11 to ensure that Quebec's cultural specificity is protected. It's uh, asking the Prime Minister, who is still supported by the Bloc, to ensure that before Bill C-11 is passed, it includes a formal consultation mechanism for the government of Quebec. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Minister Lacombe regarding Quebec culture and that his government should send the bill to Parliament for study? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, we are working very well with the Quebec government on the file of culture and other files as well. And moreover, the Bloc and the NDP and the Liberal Party understand the importance of culture and the importance of act asking streamers and Netflix and others well, to contribute to Canadian culture. But there is one party that decided to turn its back on the cultural sector, or turn its back on our creators and our produ producers and directors. It's the Conservatives. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg or Saint Charles, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Canadian Heritage says one, that the Quebec 
bloc is often looking for disputes, but C10, 15, C15, C11, well, can the minister answer? Will the government send this bill, C11, to Kinney Committee to stu study Quebec's request? Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, true, often the bloc does look for disputes, but in terms of this bill, C11, it's not the case. I'm wondering how a member for Quebec and other colleagues can come debate here and say we don't need this legislation, even though everyone in Quebec is asking for it, regardless of the sector, whether it's science, music, TV, cinema. We are the best in the world at what we do, and this is in, in spite of the Conservatives. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Mr. Speaker, how come a member from Quebec and a minister from Quebec can refuse to listen to the request of the Quebec government? Bill C-11 is a centralizing piece of legislation. It gives federal government more power, and are they calling the bloc centralizing? Does the Liberal government with their friends from the bloc, will they allow the Parliamentary Committee to study the amendments from the Senate about, with respect to Quebec's right? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we work very well with Quebec uh, on, the, on the cultural file and, and on many levels. But what the Conservatives want is to continue to filibuster, Mr. Speaker. They have done this across the board. They've talked just about, about just about anything with a great deal of talent, I must admit. But at the end of the day, we need this legislation. We are in competition with many giants worldwide, and we have to remain the best. And we need C11. We're going to consult Quebec, despite what the Conservatives say, the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I would ask the minister to be prudent. Listening to Quebec is not filibustering. It's shameful that they would say that. This Liberal government has now joined forces with its friends at the Bloc, which is now centralizing. They refuse to adhere to Quebec's request. The Conservatives want to admit this. Will they accept our proposal to amend the legislation at committee to study Senate amendments and to listen to the Quebec government, the Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, we cooperate once again very well with Quebec. We're in constant conversation. I have seen my counterpart on culture. Well, I saw them over the weekend. And how come the Conservatives say that that's not what culture is? Come on. This is a smoke show and the biggest one of the year. Smoke and mirrors. The Conservatives have filibustered since the beginning of the year, and they don't care about culture. We are going to move forward. We are going to pr defend our producers and our cultural sector. Thank you. Before we move on to the next question, may I have your attention, please? I know that it's really emotional in the House, and sometimes emotions make us say things we don't want to say. And I would like members to perhaps be careful what they say to make sure that their language is parliamentarian. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, the authorities are concerned about a 846 percent increase in irregular border crossings. Border services are worried. They say it is extremely dangerous, especially in adverse weather conditions, which in our areas often. Mr. Speaker, it's not the federal government that is saying this. It's the Americans. The U.S. is worried because it's dangerous to cross the border in the woods in winter. But in Ottawa, when we raise the same concerns for Roxham, the government calls us intolerant. Shouldn't it be concerned about people who cross Roxham in the woods in the winter? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, to say that asylum seekers are profiting from the system is absolutely unacceptable. The reality is that these are people 
people, Mr. Speaker, who are fleeing violence, who are seeking refuge that is safe. Mr. Speaker, the government will always work and is proud of the work it accomplishes and has accomplished with vulnerable people, and we hope that the bloc thinks the same. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean we think the thing, same thing, but we have the same positions uh, but with respect to the third uh, party. These are people who are being exploited. They have lonely children going through the winter. People are imprisoned for an indefinite period of time, and they're doing nothing because it suits them. And on the other side, there's the federal government, which is incapable of going beyond nice words and capable, incapable of realizing that it's not what welcoming immigrants, immigrants with dignity is all about. So what do we do? Nothing will move until they suspend the safe third country agreement. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary, Mr. Speaker, the bloc, in my opinion, and I think we can say it's lost all its credibility when they think that asylum seekers cross this border for an all-inclusive vacation? Or do they think that this is a joke. Mr. Speaker, it's not a joke for us. It's serious. We're working on this file. We talk with our counterparts in the U.S., and that's what we're going to do to modernize this agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, the government now believes it no longer needs the Auditor General's advice. The Auditor General identified $27 billion of COVID support payments that should be investigated, except the CRA says now it's not worth the effort to review those payments. Now, the Parliamentary Budget Officer is now ringing the alarm bell, saying he too is concerned if the CRA will not review these payments. So, Mr. Speaker, will the government finally take the advice of the Auditor General, review these COVID payments, and make sure that Canadians recover improper payments Here paid by this government? I think that'd be a yes. The gold Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I have a very good working relationship with the critic for, uh, for the Conservatives on National Revenue, but he knows very well that the CRA, and this was verified at the Public Accounts Committee some days ago, that that verification work is ongoing. I've said that many times in this House. I'm glad to repeat it again. This government instructed the CRA to carry out that work. Every member in this House uh, voted in that direction. So let's let, let, let that work continue. Instead, the Conservatives continue to play uh, political games to undermine a, a very important public institution in this country. It's not acceptable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, government services are broken. Liberals have significantly grown the size of the public service while still giving billions of dollars to outside consultants, and yet nothing seems to work. Now, the Prime Minister has admitted that he personally recruited Dominic Barton and provided him with preferential access, access that his company, McKinsey, used to do over $100 million in business with government. So how can Liberals explain the fact that the public service is larger, the services Canadians receive are declining, and yet Liberals are still able to find so much money for their well-connected friends? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the use of contracts by government, uh, and it's done independently at arm's length by the public service, is something that is incredibly important in the provision of services. And I would say to the member opposite uh, that right now there are two million more Canadians, almost, who have jobs that didn't when the Conservatives were there. There are 2.7 million Canadians who are not in poverty now who were when the Conservatives were in power. The idea that the progress isn't being made is not substantiated by fact, Mr. Right, Speaker. That's right. Here, here. Well, member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, hiring more people at McKinsey is not a jobs plan. <laughs> the House leader should listen to his Prime Minister because the Prime Minister said of Dominic Barton, quote, we recruited him, end quote. Now, Dominic Barton admitted in testimony that Andrew Pickersgill, the head of McKinsey's Canadian operations, supplied analysts to the Prime Minister's Growth Council. McKinsey then used that access to set up sales meetings. The Prime Minister recruited McKinsey leaders, gave them privileged access to government, and that allowed them to get over $100 million in contracts. So will the House Leader stop this charade, admit what the Prime Minister has already admitted, that it was these Liberal politicians that brought in McKinsey? Yeah. The Honourable Government.
Event House Leader. Mr. Speaker, on numerous occasions, the member opposite has inferred uh, that political interference uh, would be something that they would engage in to tell the public service who they would engage in contracts. Let me say on this side of the House, we will tolerate no such action, uh, that the independence of the public service and the engaged contracts is absolutely important. The number of the conspiracy theories the member has peddled have been uh, disproven as in front of committee. Uh, there are forums on Reddit where he can continue to pursue these, but I would suggest the House of Commons is not the appropriate forum. The Honourable Member for Dorval, Lachine Lasalle. Mr. Speaker, over the past seven months, while we've seen a steady reduction in inflation, many Canadians are still struggling with the cost of living. Can the Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance tell the House what the government is doing to help Canadians with this global phenomenon? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, first I'd like to thank my colleague for Darval for her question and hard work. People around the world are going through tough economic times, and Canadians are no exception. This is why we reduced child care costs, doubled the GST tax credit, eliminated interest on student loans, and provided a one-time housing supplement, and offered dental support for $500,000 children. All of these, for, and putting money back in the pockets of Canadians. And Rideau Lakes. This Liberal Trade Minister had former Liberal Minister Michael Chan chair her election campaigns. Turns out Mr. Chan is on a CSIS watch list for alleged connections to a spy network of the Chinese Communist regime. And the Prime Minister's senior staff, including Katie Telford, were told to warn the Trade Minister to be cautious in her dealings with Mr. Chan. The Trade Minister refused to answer the question yesterday. I'll ask again, why did the Minister ignore the warnings from PMO and Canada's intelligence service about having Mr. Chan chair her campaign, even though he had ties to spies for Communist China. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, embedded in the question uh, is a false notion that I think all members, I would hope, want to reject, uh, and that is that there is any member of Parliament who is not completely and totally committed to Canadian democracy. And the idea that there is anybody in this House who would tolerate foreign interference in any form is simply inaccurate and not appropriate to uh, put forward as a supposition. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, obviously, some members are more concerned than others. And let's be clear, it's our National Intelligence Service that has alleged that former Liberal Minister Michael Chan has direct connections to a spy network from Communist China. That's why he's on their watch list. He also chaired campaigns for this Liberal Trade Minister. The Prime Minister was warned about Liberal Minister Michael Chan and was told to warn the Trade Minister. Who is the Liberal Trade Minister taking her advice from if she's ignoring the PMO and CSIS? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I think that we need to be very careful uh, when we can talk to one another about casting aspersions about our loyalty to this country and our loyalty to democracy. Mr. Speaker, it is a, it is a presumption in every question that we ask uh, that every member is dead. I, I... <laughs> I want to thank all those who had quiet all of a sudden and the person who didn't see me who kept going. But uh, <laughs> the Honourable Government House Leader, from the top, please. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the supposition is that the, uh, that the member that they are questioning, the minister that they are questioning, is not loyal to her country, is not loyal to Canada or to our democracy, and that they are somehow subservient to a foreign force. Let me be very clear, and I would not say this to any member on the other side. We may disagree on policy, but to suggest that there is anybody that is not loyal to our democracy, to try to cast aspersions on a member of this place, to say that they do not have at their core interests this country is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. The facts, Mr. Speaker, is that the 
Liberal Trade Minister was found guilty of violating ethics law for awarding a multi-thousand dollar contract to her best friend. This week it was revealed that the same minister hired a former Liberal Cabinet Minister Michael Chan to work on her election campaign. The problem is that the Liberals were notified by CSIS that Mr. Chan is on the watch list because of his ties to the who? The Chinese Communist regime. Why has the minister not yet resigned from her position for having adopted the bad habits blindly of this Liberal Prime Minister, the Honourable Government House Leader? Mr. Speaker, that's totally unacceptable to say that, well, there is no one in this House here who is not loyal to our country. It is clear. The minister, not just the minister, every member in this House is absolutely loyal to Canada and to our democracy, and it is unacceptable to say the opposite. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Mr. Speaker, isolated Arctic and northern communities face complex food security challenges, including access to local food options. As a member of the Standing Committee of Indigenous and Northern Affairs, I know that Northern and Indigenous partners are implementing innovative solutions to address the mounting challenges they face, including food sovereignty in their communities. Can the minister update this House on the work our government is doing in partnership to address food security in the North and the Arctic? Here. Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Fredericton for her important question. I know how hard she works, and I know she's absolutely passionate about this question, about this issue. All Canadians, no matter where they live, deserve access to healthy and affordable food all year round. Just this month, increased subsidy rates are reducing the cost of food into communities across the North and the Arctic. And our government's funding for the Harvester Support Grant supported over 5,500 harvesters, 150 hunts, and 120 food sharing initiatives in its first year. Together, we are deliver delivering locally led solutions for the North by the North. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. The Nunavut communities want to be part of the solution uh, on climate emergency. They want to stop relying on unreliable and outdated diesel plants. The Kivadluk Hydro Fiber Link is an Inuit-led project that would transition several Nunavut communities off diesel to renewable energy. This government needs to keep its promises and continue to invest so this project could become a reality. Will the Prime Minister commit to the Kivadluk Hydro Fiber Link in the 2023 budget? The Honourable Minister. I thank the Honourable Member for that very important question. Our government is absolutely committed to transitioning northern and Arctic communities to clean, uh, reliable and uh, renewable energy. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the remote and indigenous clean energy hub. Uh, we've developed the Indigenous Climate Leadership Initiative. And just last week, I had a fantastic meeting with the uh, Kivalik Fiber Optic Group. We've invested uh, uh, significant sums in the Kivalik project, as well as the Atlan project in Yukon and, uh, and Tolston and Northwest Territories. There's a lot of work to do, but we are going in the right direction. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. There has been radio silence from this Prime Minister since Alberta energy workers called out his government to get serious about a clean energy future. Joe Biden's clean energy tech investments are transforming the American economy, and Alberta workers have been clear. There's a huge opportunity to create a sustainable future rooted in clean tech and good paying union jobs. But this means the government actually comes to the table with investments. So to the Minister right. of Natural Resources, does this government actually have a plan, and are they ready to commit in this coming budget? Budget than funds necessary for a clean energy economy. The Honourable Minister of, the, uh, of Natural Resources. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. I certainly agree with many of the things that he said. It is increasingly and incredibly important for this country to have a relevant economic strategy for a world that is moving towards lower carbon. That is something that we have been working on for the past number of years. You certainly saw it reflected in the fall economic statement with respect to the tax credit for hydrogen and for clean technology deployment. We are going to continue to ensure that we are working forward to build a strong and prosperous economy for Canada in the context of fighting climate change concurrently. Again, it would be lovely if in this House the Conservative Party would actually acknowledge the reality of climate change and have a relevant economic plan. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. C'est tout le temps. That's all the time we have today. If I may have your attention, please.